Hi there. I am Lewis, as I always am. Um, you may have listened to the previous episode of the podcast in which I said I was going to do a short story called The Donor by Claire McIntosh, which is a spectacular short story. But um, I picked it up off my bookshelf this morning and thought, this is a bit thicker than I remember it being. And I looked up um, on Audible, actually, how long the audiobook version is. And it's nearly two and a half hours. And that's just too long for a sort of a, a short a podcast like the ones that we do here. Um, so instead, we are you doing an old uh, horror story by Stephen King that I really like called Jerusalem's Lot. I've talked a great deal on the main podcast about my sort of deep, deep fondness for Salem's Lot, um, which is, I think, Stephen King's second book. Um, might be his third. I might have gotten that one wrong, but I think it's the second. But that is a utterly spectacular vampire novel. And this is unrelated, it just happens in the same place. Um, I absolutely adore this short story, it's one of my favourites. Um, and it, again, is from Night Shift, which was a big collected edition of short stories, which, let me have a look at the facsimile page, I think it came out, here we do, yeah. Uh, I think these stories all came out separately because uh, Stephen King was writing for magazines and, and stuff like that. Then I think they were published as like a collected edition. It looks like in 1978 in Great Britain. Um, so yeah, that's what the facsimile page says. Anyway, um, if, you, if I'm wrong, let me know. I will be genuinely curious to see what the truth is. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> without further ado, Let's get started on Jerusalem's Lot by Stephen King. 2nd of October, 1850. Dear Bones, How good it was to step into the cold, drafty hall here at Chapelwaite. Every bone in an ache from that abominable coach, in need of instant relief from my distended bladder, and to see a letter addressed in your own inimitable scrawl propped on the obscene little cherrywood table beside the door. Be assured that I set to deciphering it as soon as the needs of the body were attended to in a coldly ornate downstairs bathroom where I could see my breath rising before my eyes. I'm glad to hear that you are recovered from the miasma that has so long set in your lungs. Although I assure you that I do sympathise with the moral dilemma the cure has afflicted you with. An ailing abolitionist healed by the sunny climes of slave-struck Florida. Still on all bones, I ask you as a friend who has also walked in the Valley of the Shadow to take all care of yourself and venture not back to Massachusetts until your body gives you leave. Your fine mind and incisive pen cannot serve as if you are clay, and if the southern zone is a healing one, is there not poetic justice in that? Yes, the house is quite fine as I had been led to believe by my cousin's executors, but rather more sinister. It sits atop a huge and jutting point of land perhaps three miles north of Falmouth and nine miles north of Portland. Behind it are some four acres of grounds, gone back to the wild in the most formidable manner imaginable. Junipers, scrub vines, bushes, and various forms of creeper climb wildly over the picturesque stone walls that separate the estate from the town domain. Awful imitations of Greek statuary peer blindly through the rack from atop various hillocks. They seem, in most cases, about to lunge at the passerby. My cousin Stephen's tastes seem to have run the gamut from the unacceptable to the downright horrific. There is an odd little summer house which has been nearly buried in scarlet sumac and a grotesque sundial in the midst of what must once have been a garden. It adds the final lunatic touch. But the view from the parlour more than excuses this. I command a dizzying view of the rocks at the foot of Chapelwaite Head and the Atlantic itself. A huge bellied bay window looks out on this, and a huge toad-like secretary stands behind it. It will do nicely for the start of that novel which I have talked of so long, and no doubt tiresomely. Today has been grey with occasional splatters of rain. As I look out, all seems to be a study in slate. The rocks, old and worn as time itself, the sky, and of course the sea, which crashes against the granite fangs below, with a sound which is not precisely sound, but vibration. I can feel the waves even with my feet as I write. The sensation is not a wholly unpleasant one. I know you disprove of my solitary habits, dear Bones, but I assure you that I am fine and happy. Calvin is here with me, as practical, silent, and as dependable as ever. And by midweek I am sure that between the two of us we shall have straightened our affairs and made arrangements for necessary deliveries from town, and a company of cleaning women to begin blowing the dust from this place. I will close. 
There are so many things as yet to be seen, rooms to explore, and doubtless a thousand pieces of execrable furniture to be viewed by these tender eyes. Once again, my thanks for the touch of the familiar brought by your letter, and for your continuing regard. Give my love to your wife, as you both have mine. Charles. The 6th of October, 1850. Dear Bones, such a place is this! It continues to amaze me, as do the reactions of the town folk in the closest village to my occupancy. That is a queer little place with the picturesque name of Preacher's Corners. It was there that Calvin contracted for the weekly provisions. The other errand, that of securing a sufficient supply of cordwood for the winter, was likewise taken care of. But Cal returned with gloomy countenance, and when I asked him what the trouble was, he replied grimly enough, They think you mad, Mr. Boone. I laughed and said that perhaps they had heard of the brain fever I suffered after my Sarah died. Certainly I spoke madly enough at that time, as you could attest. But Cal protested that no one knew anything of me except through my cousin Stephen, who contracted for the same services as I have now made provision for. What was said, sir, was that anyone who would live in Chapelweight must be either a lunatic or run the risk of becoming one. This left me utterly perplexed, as you may imagine, and I asked who had given him this amazing communication. He told me that he had been referred to a sullen and rather besotted pulp logger named Thompson, who owns 400 acres of pine, birch and spruce, and who logs it with the help of his five sons for sale to the mills in Portland and to the householders in the immediate area. When Cal, all unknowing of his queer prejudice, gave him the location to which the wood was to be brought, this Thompson stared at him with his mouth ajaw and said that he would send his sons with the wood in the good light of day and by the sea road. Calvin, apparently misreading my bemusement for distress, hastened to say that the man reeked of cheap whiskey, and that he had lapsed into some kind of nonsense about a deserted village and Cousin Stephen's relations, and worms. Calvin finished his business with one of Thompson's boys, who, I take it, was rather surly and none too sober or freshly scented himself. I take it there has been some of this reaction in Preacher's Corners itself, at the general store where Cal spoke with the shopkeeper, although this was more of the gossipy behind the hand type. None of this has bothered me much. We know how rustics dearly love to enrich their lives with the smell of scandal and myth, and I suppose poor Stephen and his side of the family are fair game. As I told Cal, a man who has fallen to his death almost from his own front porch is more than likely to stir talk. The house itself is a constant amazement. Twenty-three rooms, Bones! The wainscoting which panels the upper floors and the portrait gallery is mildewed but still stout. While I stood in my late cousin's upstairs bedroom, I could hear the rats scuttering behind it, and big ones they must be from the sound they make. Almost like people walking there. I should hate to encounter one in the dark, or even in the light for that matter. Still, I have noted neither holes nor droppings. Odd. The upper gallery is lined with bad portraits in frames which must be worth a fortune. Some bear a resemblance to Stephen as I remember him. I believe I have correctly identified my uncle Henry Boone and his wife Judith, the others are unfamiliar. I suppose one of them may be my own notorious grandfather, Robert, but Stephen's side of the family is all but unknown to me, for which I am heartily sorry. The same good humour that shone in Stephen's letters to Sarah and me, the same light of high intellect, shines in these portraits, bad as they are. For what foolish reasons families fall out? A rifled escritoire, harsh words between brothers now dead three generations, and blameless descendants are needlessly estranged. I cannot help reflecting upon how fortunate it was that you and John Petty succeeded in contacting Stephen when it seemed I might follow my Sarah through the gates, and upon how unfortunate it was that a chance should have robbed us of a face-to-face -face meeting. How I would have loved to hear him defend the ancestral statuary and furnishings. But do not let me denigrate the place to an extreme. Stephen's taste was not my own, true, but beneath the veneer of his additions there are pieces, a number of them shrouded by dust covers in the upper chambers, which are true masterworks. There are beds, tables, and heavy dark scrollings done in teak and mahogany, and many of the bedrooms and receiving chambers, the upper study and the small parlour, hold a sombre charm. The floors are rich pine that glow with an inner and secret light. There is dignity here, dignity in the weight of years. I cannot yet say I like it, but I do respect it. I am eager to watch it change as we revolve through the changes of this northern clime. Lord, I run on. Right soon, Bones. Tell me what progress you make and what news you hear from Petty and the rest. 
and please do not make the mistake of trying to persuade any new southern acquaintances as to your views too forcibly. I understand that not all are content to answer merely with their mouths, as is our long-winded friend, Mr. Calhoun. Your affectionate friend, Charles. 16th of October, 1850. Dear Richard, Hello, and how are you? I have thought about you often since I have taken up residence here at Chattelwaite, Wade, and had half expected to hear from you, and now I receive a letter from Bones telling me that I'd forgotten to leave my address at the club. Rest assured that I would have written eventually anyway, as it sometimes seems that my true and loyal friends are all I have left in the world that is sure and completely normal. And Lord, how spread we've become! You in Boston, writing faithfully for the Liberator, to which I have also sent my address, incidentally, Hansen in England on another of his confounded jaunts, and poor old Bones in the very lion's lair, recovering his lungs. It goes as well as can be expected here, Dick, and be assured I will render you a full account when I am not quite as pressed by certain events which are extant here. I think your legal mind may be intrigued by certain happenings at Chapelwaite and in the area about it, but in the meantime I have a favour to ask if you will entertain it. Do you remember the historian you introduced me to at Mr. Clary's fundraising dinner for the cause? I believe his name was Bigelow? At any rate, he mentioned that he made a hobby of collecting odd bits of historical lore which pertain to the very area in which I am now living. My favour, then, is this. Would you contact him and ask if... Would you contact him and ask what facts, bits of folklore, or general rumour, if any, he may be conversant with about a small deserted village called Jerusalem's Lot, near a township called Preacher's Corners, on the Royal River? The stream itself is a tributary of the Androscoggin, and flows into that river approximately eleven miles above the river's emptying place near Chapelwaite. It would gratify me intensely, and, more importantly, may be a matter of some moment. In looking over this letter, I feel I have been a bit short with you, Dick, for which I am heartily sorry, but be assured I will explain myself shortly, and until that time, I send my warmest regards to your wife, two fine sons, and, of course, to yourself. Your affectionate friend, Charles. 16th of October, 1850. Dear Bones, I have a tale to tell you which seems a little strange and even disquieting to both Cal and me. See what you think. If nothing else, it may serve to amuse you while you battle the mosquitoes. Two days after I mailed my last to you, a group of four young ladies arrived from the corners under the supervision of an elderly lady of, of intimidatingly competent visage named Mrs. Cloris to set the place in order and to remove some of the dust that has been causing me to sneeze seemingly at every other step. They all seemed a little nervous as they went about their chores. Indeed, one flighty miss uttered a small screeth when I entered the upstairs parlour as she dusted. I asked Mrs. Cloris about this. She was dusting the downstairs hall with grim determination that would have quite amazed you, her hair done up in an old faded bandana. And she turned to me with an air of determination. They don't like the house, and I don't like the house, sir, because it has always been a bad house. My jaw dropped at this unexpected bit, and she went on in a kindlier tone. I do not mean to say that Stephen Boone was not a fine man, for he was. I cleaned for him every second Thursday all the time he was here, as I cleaned for his father, Mr. Randolph Boone, until he and his wife disappeared in 18 and 16. Mr. Stephen was a good and kindly man, and so you seem, sir, if you will pardon my bluntness, I'd know no other way to speak. But the house is bad, and always has been, and no Boone has ever been happy here since your grandfather Robert and his brother Philip fell out of a stolen, and here she paused, almost guiltily, items in 17 and 89. Such memories these folks have, Bones. Mrs. Cloris continued. The house was built in unhappiness, and has been lived in with unhappiness. There has been blood spilt on its floors, as you may or may not know, Bones. My uncle Randolph was involved in an accident on the cellar stairs, which took the life of his daughter Marcella. He then took his own life in a fit of remorse. The incident is related in one of Stephen's letters to me, on the sad occasion of his dead sister's birthday. There has been disappearance and accident. I have worked here, Mr. Boone, and I am neither blind nor deaf. I've heard awful sounds in the walls, sir. Awful sounds. Thumpings and crashings, and once a strange wailing that was half laughter. It fair made my blood curdle. It's a dark place, sir. And there she halted, perhaps afraid she had spoken too much. As for myself, I hardly knew whether to be offended or amused, curious or merely matter of fact. I'm afraid that amusement won the day. And what do you expect, Mrs. Cloris? Ghosts rattling chains? But she only looked at me oddly. Ghosts there may be. But it's not ghosts in the walls. It's not ghosts that wail and blubber like the damned and crash and blunder away in the darkness. It's come, Mrs. Cloris, I prompted her. You've come this far. Now can you finish what you've begun? 
The strangest expression of terror, pique, and, I would swear to it, religious awe passed over her face. Some die not, she whispered. Some live in the twilight shadows between to serve him. And that was the end. For some minutes I continued to tax her, but she only grew more obstinate and would say no more. At last I desisted, fearing she might gather herself up and quit the premises. This is the end of one episode, but a second occurred the following evening. Calvin had laid a fire downstairs, and I was sitting in the living room, drowsing over a copy of the Intelligencer and listening to the sound of wind-driven rain on the large bay window. I felt comfortable as only one can on such a night, when all is miserable outside and all is warmth and comfort inside. But a moment later Cal appeared at the door, looking excited and a bit nervous. Are you awake, sir? he asked. Barely, I said. What is it? I found something upstairs I think you should see, he responded, with the same air of suppressed excitement. I got up and followed him. As we climbed the wide stairs, Calvin said, I was reading a book in the upstairs study, a rather strange one, when I heard a noise in the wall. Rats, I said. Is that all? He paused on the landing, looking at me solemnly. The lamp he held cast weird, lurking shadows on the dark draperies and on the half-seen portraits that now seemed rather to leer more than smile. Outside, the wind rose to a brief scream, and then subsided grudgingly. Not rats, Cal said. There was a kind of blundering, thudding sound from behind the bookcases, and then a horrible gurgling. Horrible, sir. And scratching, as if something was struggling to get out, to get at me. You can imagine my amazement, Bones. Calvin is not the type to give away to hysterical flights of imagination. It began to seem that there was a mystery here after all, and perhaps an ugly one indeed. What, then? I asked him. We had resumed down the hall, and I could see the light from the study spilling forth onto the floor of the gallery. I viewed it with some trepidation. The night seemed no longer comfortable. The scratching noise stopped. After a moment, the thudding, shuffling sounds began again, this time moving away from me. I paused once, and I swear I heard a strange, almost inaudible laugh. I went to the bookcase and began to push and pull, thinking there might be a partition or a secret door. You found one? Cal paused at the door to the study. No, but I found this. We stepped in and I saw a square black hole in the left case. The books at that point were nothing but dummies, and what Cal had found was a small hiding place. I flashed my lamp within it and saw nothing but a thick fall of dust, dust which must have been decades old. There was only this, Cal said quietly, and handed me a yellowed fool's cap. The thing was a map, drawn in spider-thin strokes of black ink, the map of a town and village. There were perhaps seven buildings, and one, clearly marked with a steeple, bore this legend beneath it, The Worm That Doth Corrupt. In the upper left corner, to what would have been the northwest of this little village, an arrow pointed, inscribed beneath it, Chapelwaite. Calvin said, In town, sir, someone rather superstitiously mentioned a deserted village called Jerusalem's Lot. It's a place they steer clear of. But this? I asked, fingering the odd legend below the steeple. I don't know. A memory of Mrs. Cloris, adamant yet fearful, passed through my mind. The worm, I muttered. Do you know something, Mr. Boone? Perhaps. It might be amusing to have a look for this town tomorrow, do you think, Cal? He nodded, eyes lighting. We spent almost an hour after this looking for some breach in the wall behind the cubby hole Cal had found, but with no success. Nor was there a recurrence of the noises Cal had described. We retired with no further adventuring that night. On the following morning, Calvin and I set out on our ramble through the woods. The rain of the night before had ceased, but the sky was sombre and lowering. I could see Cal looking at me with some doubtfulness, and I hastened to reassure him that should I tire, or the journey prove too far, I would not hesitate to call a halt to the affair. We had equipped ourselves with a picnic lunch, a fine buckwhite compass, and, of course, the odd and ancient map of Jerusalem's lot. It was a strange and brooding day. Not a bird seemed to sing, nor an animal to move as we made our way through the great and gloomy stands of pine to the south and east. The only sounds were those of our own feet and the steady pound of the Atlantic against the headlands. The smell of the sea, almost preternaturally heavy, was our constant companion. We had gone no more than two miles when we struck an overgrown road of what I believe were once called the corduroy variety. This tended in our general direction and we struck off along it, making brisk time. We spoke little. The day, with its still and ominous quality, weighed heavily on our spirits. At about eleven o'clock we heard the sound of rushing water. The remnant of road took a hard turn to the left, and on the other side of a boiling, slaty little stream, like an apparition, was Jerusalem's lot. The stream was perhaps eight feet across, spanned by a moss-grown footbridge. 
On the far side, Bones stood the most perfect little village you might imagine, understandably weathered, but amazingly preserved. Several houses, done in that austere yet commanding form for which the Puritans were justly famous, stood clustered near the sheep stood clustered near the steeply sheared bank. Further beyond, along a weed-grown thoroughfare, stood three or four of what might have been primitive business establishments, and beyond that, the spire of the church marked on the map, rising up to the grey sky and looking grim beyond description with its peeled paint and tarnished leaning cross. The town is well named, Cal said softly beside me. We crossed the town and began to poke through it, and this is where my story grows slightly amazing bones, so prepare yourself. The air seemed leaden as we walked among the buildings, weighted, if you will. The edifices were in a state of decay, shutters torn off, roofs crumbled under the weight of heavy snows gone by, windows dusty and leering. Shadows from odd corners and warped angles seemed to sit in sinister pools. We entered an old and rotting tavern first. Somehow it did not seem right that we should invade any of those houses to which people had retired when they wished privacy. An old and weather-scrubbed sign above the splintered door had announced that this had been the Boar's Head Inn and Tavern. The door creaked hellishly on its one remaining hinge, and we stepped into the shadow's interior. The smell of rotten mould was vaporous and nearly overpowering, and beneath it seemed to lie an even deeper smell, a slimy and pestiferous smell, a smell of ages and the decay of ages. Such a stench as might issue from corrupt coffins or violated tombs. I held my handkerchief to my nose, and Cal did likewise. We surveyed the place. My god, sir, Cal said faintly. It's never been touched, I finished for him. As indeed it had not. Tables and chairs stood about like ghostly guardians of the watch, dusty, warped by the extreme changes in temperature for which the New England climate is known, but otherwise perfect, as if they had waited through the silent echoing decades for those long gone to enter once more, to call for a pint or a dram, to deal cards and like clay pipes. A small square mirror hung beside the rules of the tavern, unbroken. Do you see the significance, Bones? Small boys are noted for exploration and vandalism. There is not a haunted house which stands with windows intact, no matter how fearsome the eldritch inhabitants are rumoured to be. Not a shadowy graveyard with at least one tombstone upended by young pranksters. Certainly, there must be a score of young pranksters in Preacher's Corners, not two miles from Jerusalem's lot. Yet the innkeeper's glass, which must have cost him a nice sum, was intact as were the other fragile items we found in our pokings. The only damage in Jerusalem's lot has been done by impersonal nature. The implication is obvious. Jerusalem's lot is a shunned town, but why? I have a notion, but before I even dare hint at it, I must proceed to the unsettling conclusion of our visit. We went up to the sleeping quarters and found beds made up, pewter water pitchers neatly placed beside them. The kitchen was likewise untouched by anything save the dust of the years and that horrible sunken stench of decay. The tavern alone would be an antiquarian's paradise. The wondrously queer kitchen stove would fetch a pretty price at a Boston auction. What do you think, Cal? I asked when we had emerged again into the uncertain daylight. I think it's bad business, Mr. Boone, he replied in his doleful way, and that we must see more to know more. We gave the other shops scant notice. There was a hostelry with mouldering leather goods still hung on rusted flat nails, a chandler's, a warehouse with oak and pine still stacked within, and a smithy. We entered two houses as we made our way towards the church at the centre of the village. Both were perfectly in the Puritan mode, full of items a collector would give his arm for, both deserted and full of the same rotten scent. Nothing seemed to live or move in all of this but ourselves. We saw no insects, no birds, not even a cobweb fashioned in a window corner, only dust. At last we reached the church. It reared above us, grim, uninviting, cold. Its windows were black with the shadows inside, as any godliness or sanctity had departed from it long ago. Of that I am certain. We mounted the steps, and I placed my hand on the large iron door pull. A set, dark look passed from myself to Calvin and back again. I opened the portal. How long since that door had been touched? I would say with confidence that mine was the first in fifty years, perhaps longer. Rust-clogged hinges screamed as I opened it. The smell of rotten decay which smote us was nearly palpable. Cal made a gagging sound in his throat and twisted his head involuntarily for clearer air. Sir, he asked, are you sure that you are? I'm fine, I said calmly. But I did not feel calm, Bones, no more than I do now, I believe, with Moses, with Jeroboam, with Increase Martha, with our own Hanson when he was in as 
philosophical temperament that there are spiritually noxious places, buildings where the milk of the cosmos has become sour and rancid. This church is such a place, I would swear to it. We stepped into a long vestibule equipped with a dusty coat rack and shelved hymnals. It was windowless. Oil lamps stood in its niches here and there. An unremarkable room, I thought, until I heard Calvin's sharp gasp and saw what he had already noticed. It was an obscenity. I daren't describe that elaborately framed picture further than this, that it was done after the fleshy style of Rubens, and that it contained a grotesque travesty of Madonna and Child, that strange, half-shadowed creatures sported and crawled in the background. Lord, I whispered, there's no Lord here, Calvin said, and his words seemed to hang in the air. I opened the door leading into the church itself, and the odour became a miasma, nearly overpowering. In the glimmering half-light of afternoon, the pews stretched ghost-like to the altar. Above them was a high oaken pulpit, and a shadow-struck narthex from which gold glimmered. With a half-sob, Calvin, that devout Protestant, made the holy sign, and I followed suit. For the gold was a large, beautifully wrought cross, but it was hung upside down, symbol of Satan's mass. We must be calm, I heard myself saying. We must be calm, Calvin, we must be calm. But a shadow had touched my heart, and I was afraid as I had never been. I have walked beneath death's umbrella and thought there was none darker, but there is. There is. We walked down the aisle, our footfalls echoing above and around us. We left tracks in the dust, and at the altar there were other tenebrous objet art. I will not and cannot let my mind dwell upon them. I began to mount the pulpit itself. Don't, Mr. Boone, Cal cried suddenly. I'm afraid, but I had gained it. A huge book lay open which looked upon the stand, writ in both Latin and crabbed runes which looked to my unpractised eye either druidic or pre-Celtic. I enclose a card with several of the symbols, redrawn from memory. I closed the book and looked at the words stamped into leather. De vermis mysteris. My Latin is rusty, but serviceable enough to translate the mysteries of the worm. As I touched it, that accursed church and Calvin's white upturned face seemed to swim before me. It seemed that I heard low, chanting voices full of hideous yet eager fear, and below that sound another filling the bowels of the earth. An hallucination, I doubt it not, but at the same moment the church was filled with a very real sound, which I could only describe as a huge and macabre turning beneath my feet. The pulpit trembled beneath my fingers, and the desecrated cross trembled upon the wall. We exited together, Cal and I, leaving the place to its own darkness, and neither of us dared look back until we had crossed the rude planks spanning the stream. I will not say we defiled the nineteen hundred years man has spent climbing upwards from a hunkering and superstitious savage by actually running, but I would be a liar to say that we strolled. That is my tale. You mustn't shadow your recovery by fearing that the fever has touched me again. Cal can attest to all in these pages, up to and including the hideous noise. So I close, saying only that I wish I might see you, knowing that much of my bewilderment would drop away immediately, and that I remain your friend and admirer, Charles. Okay, I, I really adore this story. I know it's it's um very sort of basic of me to, to, to enjoy a horror story that's written in sort of old tiny language, but I just do. Plus, I adore horror stories which are written as letters to and from people, whether it's like a, an old letter like this or like in Dracula or if it's like a, a, a captain's log ship entry in a Star Trek style reality. I absolutely adore that way of storytelling. It's so personal and it makes the story feel so much more intimate almost. Um, I, I like that the build here is sort of slow and rational. They make pretty sensible choices. They're curious people in a weird place. They make sensible choices and they... Yeah, all right, we might as well go and check out this weird, mysterious place for which a suspicious map we found in our study sort of thing. I like that a lot, and I absolutely love the setting. I, I love that this this uh, terrified New England landscape... I know I read a lot of Stephen King, so I'm very used to these sort of chilling New England villages, but I think this one is particularly good because it sort of... In more period settings, you you leave the door open for more intense sort of superstition. And I think this book does that very, very well. This short story, rather, does that very, very well. They go into the town, and they it can very easy to dismiss it as superstition. Oh, this man who owned the lumber yard, he, he smelled the whiskey, and he was going on about ghosts or something. Well, I, don't, I don't know. And then all these, these um, 
cleaning ladies came to the house and they were jumping at noises and oh they're just just simple simple folk from from a backwater town in the middle of nowhere sort of thing um i really like that the characters are headstrong and arrogant because so often you read um uh, horror stories or watch horror stories where the main characters are sort of wonderfully bright shining examples of humanity and yeah they those stories have their place but i like that these characters are sort of like um charles is kind of a dick like he sort of speaks down to his manservant and he's he's sort of um speaks down about the the townsfolk and he is kind of a dick and i kind of like that because it means that he's a more real person and i really like this story and um, I'll be reading out the second half of it and giving my thoughts on the second half of it uh, in the next episode, which I think this one is coming out on Friday, so that one will be coming out on, on Sunday. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. We're going to, well, we, I, am going to do a little bit of chilling now. So I know people don't like this bit, but, you know, we've got to do it. Um, the show has assorted link trees. You can go to linktr.ee slash lewis underscore brindley for me, slash ohiram for danny, and slash shouting into the void for the podcast as a whole. There you can find links to absolutely everything, to our social medias, to our merch store, to our YouTube channel, all all sorts of places, all sorts of things. Um, if you are interested in our merch, go and take a look. We uh, sell stuff on both li- on, on Linktree. We sell stuff on um, Teespring, which I think is called Spring now, and uh, Redbubble. Uh, you can go online and you can check out those our stores on those places. You can find our links in our link trees there. Loads of good stuff going on over there. Um, I quite like our tote bag. Um, it's got like a little stupid thing on it and i quite like it um also if you want to get early access to our content and ad free content and you want to sort of offer interesting things for us to talk about in the show or offer your own opinions on things that we talk about then you can go to our patreon that's patreon.com slash shouting into the void where you can sign up for as little i think i calculated it once it was like 20p an episode or even less uh, but yeah you can sign up for just a little bit of cash and uh, you'll get access to the patreon only part of our discord server and you can join in with the with the community over there which we absolutely love and yeah you get all sorts of perks you can go on to our patreon to, to have a cheeky look at that um okay links and link trees and stuff will probably be in the description or the show notes or wherever you're listening to this um so yeah thank you very much i will see you on sunday for the second half of this spooky tale Whoa. there's no ghosts i don't know what noise worms make um i'm not gonna try okay thank you for listening <laughs>